text this morning comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare a way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his face pass straight. And John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him beside the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it was written. The word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As small and insignificant as I am, Lord... Help me speak of great things. And may the eyes of our congregation through your word be caused to see your grandeur. May our souls be made to bow down to your transforming love and grace. And in our rising up from the pit of sin and death, be made to be true disciples of your Son filled with his loving grace. For we ask it in the name of your Son and for his sake. Amen. Well, it looks like those lectionary knuckleheads got it wrong again. You know, um, they just don't seem to be able to get into the Christmas spirit. We, why do they only have, why don't they give us Matthew and Luke, you know, where there's angels and songs from heaven, you know, And everybody's feeling good. Uh, You know, startled people people, and some barnyard critters and some well-worn, tired, sage men. Or they could have given us John's gospel where it begins in the cosmos at the very beginning of time itself. Well, I guess, I guess it could have been worse. They could have given us the book of Revelation to start off with. No, Mark is not concerned with angels, nor Bethlehem, nor mangers, or swaddling clothes. Mark begins his gospel in the murky waters of the Jordan River. Now in South Carolina, the vernacular would call it a crick, but they called it a river. And on the banks of that narrow river, are sinners of every sort and stripe, yearning for the wholeness of spirit, longing, longing, if you will, for forgiveness, desiring, desiring salvation. In the water, in the water are those who have yielded their soul to this baptizer's spoken word. Standing in that water is a man by the name of John. He's not dressed in fine linen. He's not wearing a robe. This was before the wearing of the yarmulke began. So his head is bare, his beard is long and scraggly, and his hair is twisted by the wind. He's a bug eater who wore camel hair and ate honey. And I bet he smelled rather badly. But enough of John. Back to us. Who wants to hear about sin at Christmas? Talking about sin is a Debbie Downer, isn't it? It's depressing. It takes the energy right out of us. Christmas is supposed to be a time of joy and happiness, of merriment. It's a time to feast, 
It's a time to remember things, to collect memories, and to make new memories. We want a Joel Osteen type sermon, you know, positive thinking that gives us goosebumps and tells us we're going to be millionaires next year. Mark, John, muddy water, sin, bah humbug. But there he is. And we just can't get away from him. He's preaching about sin. He's calling people to confess their sins. To fess up about their wicked ways. He's begging them to change their lives. Why? Because the Messiah is coming. Now let me ask you something. If the queen were coming to your house, would it stay the same as it is right now? Honestly. No, I believe you'd vacuum the carpets, and you'd mop the floors, you would dust the corners, you would uh, probably hire somebody to wash the windows, clean out the gutters. You would probably even go to your bed, or the bed she's going to sleep in, and knowing full well you just clean those sheets and comforters, and no one has slept in it since you changed those sheets and that comforter, you probably take it all off and take it to the cleaners and have it pressed and bring it back and put it back on the bed. You do it because the queen is coming. And it's the same kind of mentality that John is telling these people standing on that riverbank. The Messiah is coming. You need to clean your souls. You need to vacuum your souls. And when this Messiah comes... Souls will be healed. Relationships will be reconciled between people. And most importantly, relationship with God is going to be reconciled. It will, it will reconcile back a dark and violent world to the creator of the cosmos. And in the midst of John's evangelistic sermon comes his cousin. Now, I don't know about your cousins, but if I were standing in the creek and I saw my cousins coming, I'd probably get out of the water for a minute to see if they meant me harm or not. But John is standing there in that water and he sees his cousin coming and he's inviting and Jesus comes in and submits himself to the same baptism that all the other sinners have submitted themselves to. Why? Why? Because it's expected. And it fulfills. And it's also an act to cleanse for the original sin of humanity. The story, however, doesn't really begin there in those murky, muddy waters of the Jordan. The story actually begins way back in that book called Genesis, the beginning. And you've heard me tell this story before. I love the story where our primordial parents are there in a gorgeous uh, garden, They have everything they could want. They have everything they need. And this shadowy figure comes into their garden, into Paradiso, and whispers in the ear of Eve and says, Psst, psst, you don't have everything. You're lacking something. Sounds a whole lot like our egos, doesn't it? You're lacking something. And if you'll do this, or if you'll do that, you will get the thing you lack the most. And when you do that, you're going to be whole. You're going to be complete. You're going to be somebody. You will be somebody. Well, she does exactly what that voice tells her to do. And you know, you've heard it say, said, misery loves company. Well, so does sin. Sin loves company too. And she can't hold it all back for herself. She goes and shares it with her significant other. Okay. But my favorite part of that story, if you can have a favorite part of the fall of humanity, is when they play the blame game. And it sounds so much like postmodern world, the postmodern world in which we live, where no one can take responsibility for anything. You know, we'll, we'll blame the wall for tripping us. We just can't take responsibility. And Adam says to God, she made me do it. 
And Eve says to God, he made me do it, that shadowy figure. They just pass it right along and not take credibility, uh, credit for anything they have done. You know, I'm reminded of Robert E. Lee right after the Battle of Gettysburg. And you know, thousands were slaughtered in an awful manner in that battle on both sides. And Lee called together his staff. And he said, I take full responsibility for this defeat. All of this is entirely my fault. Now, I don't know if he read that or not, but Eisenhower did something very similar to that before the invasion took place in Normandy. On a card, he wrote out that he was responsible for that invasion of when it took place, how it was to take place, and why it was to take place, and where it was to take place. That he alone, if it failed, was, was responsible for that failure. Now contrast that same kind of leadership with modern day leadership where few are willing to take responsibilities, few are willing to admit their faults and failures, even fewer are ready to acknowledge their actions or attitudes for what they are, unmitigated sin. There are no excuses for any of it. Now, there are three types of sin in Judaism. Uh, the first type of sin was Pasha. Pasha is, is the uh, sin that's disobedience to God. And if I might use an illustration, it's sort of like uh, an archer pulls back his bow and lets the arrow fly. Well, that's God in your life. He's let this arrow fly, and that arrow is supposed to strike the target in the center. And for some reason, as you're flying towards the target area, you deviate from where God has fired you, and that's a sin. And the second one is Avon, not Avon calling, Avon. And that sin is moral and ethical sin. And then lastly is Chayat. And the Chayat sin is one that's done by accident. And both of those sins set like hungry wolves at our door, are there constantly in our lying down and our rising up. But John does not seek an apology for those people by the waters. He gives them credit for their sin, and he preaches for them to repent. In other words, change your way. You don't have to stay the way you are. You don't have to be a miserable, sad, negative human being. You can change. Change your direction. Change your way. Move your soul toward the holy. Now that seems rather uncouth to our postmodern sophisticated ear. But Mark says it, and he says it, it's the good news, that it's not bad news. It's good news because it means the past is not the future. Let me repeat that. The past is not the future. The present state, the present state is not a prison date. There is hope. There is the possibility of real change. We don't have to live like victims. And we certainly don't have to live like a victimizer anymore either. We don't have to remain enslaved to a life without joy or peace or happiness, and neither do others. Repent. Change your direction. Stop and turn entirely around. Now, he's not saying 360, because if you do a 360, what happens? You end up back where you began. He's talking about 180. That's 180. Completely change the direction. Of your life. And it's not just a repentance in how you do things, it's a repentance of way of thinking. It's changing your thinking about yourself and changing your thinking about others. And when you change your thinking about self and others, guess what happens? 
the habits of your being completely change as well. The old self dies. A new person is born. And John called on the banks to that ch- for that change 21 centuries ago. And John still stands on that Jordan bank calling for us 21 centuries later on the banks of the ocean, on the banks of the Atlantic, to change our ways too. Now, if you or I are the same person we were last year, we're not changing. If we're not being transformed, we're not changing. If our anger and our bitterness and our life's disappointments and our attitudes are the same today as they were last year, we are not being transformed. And that's sad. On the other side of that as well, even if our positives haven't changed, in other words, the same level of kindness and generosity and loyalty and love today is like it was yesterday, then we're not being transformed either. We're supposed to be, Christians are in a growth process. We're getting better tomorrow than we were today, and we're better today than we were yesterday. That's why John Calvin called us, uh, said it was going on to perfection. We will never be perfect in this life until we're swallowed up by the perfect holy, by the perfect love of God. But in the process of living our lives, we are perfecting our love. Fundamental and all-encompassing change. I read an article uh, just the other day about people, now I'm sorry if you have one of these, don't tell me, please. Uh, but people who have these big fancy RVs, campers and things, and the fellow who wrote the article said this is the way rich people try to look and feel poor. And he went through it and talked about the bus and the RVs and how they have the digital TVs now and the satellite dish on top, the shower, you know, the, the microwave oven, you know, 10 people can sleep in this thing, blah, 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 pull out porticos. You know, what he was pointing to is that they take everything with them. The only thing they change is the scenery. Right? Think about it. They go from the suburb to the pine tree, or the suburb to the the pasture, or the suburb to the coast. But they're taking it all with them. Nothing has been transformed. And John would not agree with us if, if we think we're transformed by taking everything with us tomorrow that we have today. Same kind of thing. we got to leave the old self behind and accept the new scenery of God to be transformed. The adventure of new life in Christ begins when the uncomfortable patterns of the old life are left behind. There's a story about two young brothers who were caught stealing sheep, and the punishment in that day was to be branded on your forehead with the letters S-T. Sheep thief. Well, one of the brothers uh, was so embarrassed, he left the village and wandered around his remaining years from village to village. And um, just totally, totally embarrassed uh, by the letters. The other brother, however, remained in the village and he made restitution for the stolen sheep and he became a caring friend to almost everybody in that town or in that village. And the neighborhood people just learned to love him. And over time, they didn't even notice the ST on his forehead. And eventually, there was a stranger came to town and ran into the fella, this this brother, and asked the question, why does this man have ST branded on his forehead? And one of the younger uh, citizens of the village says, I don't know what it meant, but it had to have something to do with saint. Think about that. Out of his sin, repentance created a saint. We have a choice. We can lay down the cross we have been given to bear or passively live our life as though it has not been given. You know, the beauty business is a big business. 
admiring ourselves, perfecting every perceived imperfection, curling what is straight, straightening that which is curly, bleaching the highlights in, bleaching the highlights out, or coloring them out, products to make us look younger, products to make us look older, products to make the love handles to go away, you know, the high-tech splice jeans all promise to adorn and, and be beautified by this little jar of stuff. If only we could buy just one product, you know, one that will straighten, curly our hair, and whiten our teeth at the same time. Well, there's an Arizona-based cosmetics firm called Philosophy. That's the name of it, Philosophy. And it sells a moisturizer it calls Hope in a Jar. And the label on this jar of hope declares, where there is hope, there can be faith. Where there is faith, miracles can occur. Now here, the cosmetics company provides for a hefty price, the hope in a jar. But the consumer must apply their own faith if they expect a miracle to occur. They may be onto something there. But we all know that nothing we can smear on our face or rub through our hair or massage into our love handles or, or uh, rub over our cheese thighs is really going to defy the space-time continuum. It's going to be there regardless. It's not going to strip away what years have put on. And we all know that if that product was that real, or work that well, it wouldn't be advertised at 2 a.m. It'd be on the 6 o'clock news. But, but, and every cosmetic manufacturer in the world loves, depends, and exists on that word but. But we do have hope. But the problem with this hope is that too often it's rooted in hype. Unlikely, unprovable, unrepentable, unreliable. Hope based on hype leads nowhere at best and hell at worst. The passionate preacher standing there in those ancient waters 21 centuries ago didn't give his spiritually exhausted congregation a message of hope based on hype. He didn't weave some yarn about a perfect life that was just around the corner. He didn't weave a yarn that said that, you know, if you pray this prayer, or do this thing, then you're going to be a king or queen. You're going to be on the top of the mountain. You're going to have power and control over your life. He didn't say any of that. No. What he said was, if you confess your sin and transform your life, let the holy transform your life, you will be a new creature and you will have a new relationship with the holy. There's an ancient rabbinical story I'd like to conclude with. My Hebrew professor, Rabbi Stahlberg, told, this, told us in class 40 years ago this story. And uh, I love it, and I hopefully you will too. Uh, the story's about a rebellious angel who's trying to atone for his sin, and God instructs him to go to earth and retrieve the most precious thing Thing he can find and return it back to the holy as a gift. So the angel does as told, and he scours the earth and he comes upon uh, a battle, a military battle, and he sees dying on both sides, and, and he settles beside a, the body of a dying soldier and takes a drop of blood and returns it back to God. And God looks at it and says, Yes, this is precious, but it's not the most precious. So the angel returns to earth and he's going around and he, he comes upon a hospital. And the hospital is just overrun with sickness. And he goes in and the, and, and the, the staff is overworked, they're exhausted. And a nurse who is working feverishly trying to save a little boy is unsuccessful. And she just sits down on the floor and begins to cry. And the angel takes a tear. From the nurse, takes it back. And God says, yes, that is precious, but it's not the most precious. So the angel is going around again, and he sees this sheep farmer 
walking across his field with a stick in his hand, following another man. And the other man's carrying a sheep. So the angel realizes sheep owner, sheep stealer. So the angel follows the two. And the sheep stealer goes into his little lean-to shanty. And the, and the sheep owner goes up and looks in through the, muddy, dirt, the dirty window and watches what's going on inside. And he sees the sheep stealer go across the floor, pick up his daughter, kiss her on the forehead, and put her in her bunk and cover her. And then he turns around and he kisses his wife and hugs her. And suddenly the sheep owner realizes he was about to kill the husband and father of someone. And that stunned him. And he turns back around, he puts his back against the wall, and he slides down into the dirt, sort of like the nurse. And he begins to cry. And the angel comes over and thinks, you know, maybe it's this tear, maybe it's this tear. And he takes a tear off this repentant cheek and goes back to God and says, how about this? And God looks at that tear and says, yes, this is the most precious thing on earth because it's the tear of a repentant. The tear of of a repentant. Discover, discover this year the most precious gift of Christmas. Repent. Find transformation. Come and cry and be transformed. The people of God said,